This recording is part one of two for the appendicular skeleton, your girdles and appendages. The appendicular skeleton includes the upper and lower extremities, as well as the girdles, which are the bones that hold the extremities onto the axial skeleton. The upper extremity includes the scapulae, the clavicles, the humerus, as well as the radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. The lower extremity includes the innominate or coxal bones, the femur, patella, tibia, fibula, tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. When we look at the pectoral girdle, this is comprised of the bones that are going to attach the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. The pectoral girdle consists of the scapulae and the clavicles. The pectoral girdle does not articulate with the vertebral column, but rather they are held in place by muscles that extend from the vertebral column and the ribcage. Looking at the clavicles or collarbones, we see that they are rougher and more curved in males than in females. The sternal end of the clavicle is thicker and articulates with the manubrium of the sternum. As we move out laterally, the clavicle flattens out to form the acromial end, which will articulate or form a joint with the acromion process of the scapula. The scapulae are flat bones that are found in the superior posterior portion of the thorax. One of the most prominent features of the scapula is found in the posterior aspect, and this is the spine of the scapula. It helps a person orient between anterior and posterior sides of the scapula. So the spine of the scapula is very important. As we follow the spine of the scapula laterally, we see that it flattens out to form the acromion process of the scapula. Also laterally, we find the glenoid cavity of the scapula, which is a very shallow socket for a ball and socket joint as the head of the humerus will form a joint with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. We also see anteriorly the coracoid process, which is a piece of bone that st sticks out anteriorly to form a bony attachment for a muscle called coracobrachialis. As we look at the anterior view of the scapula, we also notice the subscapular fossa. Remember, a fossa is a pit or a depression. It is in the subscapular fossa that we find the subscapularis muscle. Moving back to the posterior aspect of the scapula and going to the spine of the scapula as a point of reference, we see that above the spine of the scapula, we have the supraspinous fossa. The supraspinous fossa is a pit or depression above the spine of the scapula, whereas the infraspinous fossa is the pit or depression below the spine of the scapula. These fossae are sites of attachments for a group of muscles known as the rotator cuff muscles. In the supraspinous fossa, we find supraspinatus. In the infraspinous fossa, we find infraspinatus and teres minor.
looking at these views of the scapulae, again, we can tell that the far left picture is a posterior view because we can see the prominent spine of the scapula. We can also see how it flattens out laterally to form the acromion process. We have the supraspinous fossa above the spine, the infraspinous fossa below the spine of the scapula. As we look at a lateral view of the scapula, we can see very clearly the glenoid cavity that forms a shallow socket for the ball and socket joint that forms between the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus. On the far right, we have an anterior view. We see the coracoid process here clearly. Again, a site of attachment for coracobrachialis, as well as the subscapular fossa, where we find subscapularis. This takes us to the humerus. The most proximal aspect of the humerus is rounded and forms the head of the humerus. Just distal to the head of the humerus, we see the anatomical neck. And more distal to the anatomical neck, we find the surgical neck of the humerus. You'll also notice that the humerus has some bumps there is a greater tubercle that is more lateral and a lesser tubercle that is more medially oriented. In between, in between these two tubercles is a groove known as the intertubercular groove. Some books refer to this as the intertubercular sulcus. A sulcus is a groove. We also note the deltoid tuberosity which is a rough bony protrusion on the lateral aspect, approximately a third to a halfway distally from the head of the humerus on the diaphysis of this bone. The deltoid tuberosity serves as a muscular attachment for the deltoid muscle. As we continue to proceed distally, we find on the lateral aspect the lateral epicondyle. Remember that the word condyle means a smooth curved surface. An epicondyle is a projection above a condyle. We also see more distal to the lateral epicondyle a rounded structure that is called the capitulum. The capitulum of the humerus is going to form a site of articulation for the radius, which is one of the two bones in the forearm. As we look on the medial aspect of the distal portion of the humerus, we find the medial epicondyle. The medial epicondyle is something you can feel on your own arm as you run your thumb down the inside the medial aspect of your arm towards your forearm you'll hit a large bump that is the medial epicondyle which is closest to a structure known as the trochlea the word trochlea means pulley the ulna which is the other bone in the forearm because there are two bones in the forearm, the radius, which forms a joint with the capitulum, and the ulna, which articulates or forms a joint with the trochlea. You'll notice two pits or depressions, both anteriorly, which is our picture on the left, and posteriorly, which is our picture on the right. Anteriorly, we have a pit or depression that is smaller, known as the coronoid fossa. Remember, the ulna is going to articulate with the trochlea. 
there's a piece on the ulna called the coronoid process, which will fit into the coronoid fossa on the ulna. On the posterior aspect of the humerus, we have the larger olecranon fossa. The olecranon process of the ulna fits into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. Again, anteriorly, we have the coronoid fossa, whereas posteriorly, we have the olecranon fossa. One of the ways I often recommend to students to learn the names of the bones, you can do this with the skull, you can do this with any other bones in the skeleton, is to invest in some Avery color coding labels. They come in two sizes. We have a longer size and a shorter size. These are things that I started recommending years ago at the Marietta campus and then it caught on and other teachers started recommending that their students do this as well. The Avery color coding labels uh, are something I found at Walmart. They don't have too much glue. You can write down the names of the structures and then physically stick it on the models in the lab and then remove it at the end of the lab. Other labels have a lot of glue and it ends up sticking on the models, which is not really recommended. However, these Avery model, Avery color coding labels are helpful for, for labeling those models. Here we have a picture of the humerus. Here is the head, the rounded portion of the humerus. Just like below your head is your neck, we have the anatomical neck of the humerus, just distal to the head. This would be the surgical neck. On this particular view, we have uh, the posterior aspect of the humerus. We can see the deltoid tuberosity here. We can see part of the greater tubercle here. Here we have the medial epicondyle, the olecranon fossa, and the trochlea. You'll notice on the posterior aspect of the humerus, we don't really see a good view of the capitulum. Over here, you can see the lateral epicondyle. This is a large view of the bone on the left that I just labeled. If we look at the bone on the right, we can see the greater tubercle, which is laterally oriented, the medial lesser tubercle, greater tubercle, which is lateral, lesser tubercle, which is medial, and in between the two tubercles, is the intertubercular groove. We see the deltoid tuberosity, which is the site of attachment for the deltoid muscle. We see the trochlea, which is a pulley-like structure. Anteriorly, we have the coronoid fossa, and here we have our rounded capitulum. Notice how we don't see the capitulum easily on the posterior aspect. We see it really well on the anterior aspect. These x-rays are wonderful views of what happens when there is a fracture at the surgical neck. This is a comminuted fracture, so there's lots of fragments, and that's why a rod and several screws are utilized to hold the pieces of bone together to approximate them for healing to take place in a manner that will 
allow the bones to heal quickly and completely. Of course, there's a process of remodeling, as you know, that has to occur with the process of healing. Here we have the two bones that are involved in the forearm. The radius articulates with the capitulum of the humerus, whereas the ulna articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. On the picture on the left, you can see the radius on the left and the ulna on the right. On the picture on the right, we have the posterior aspect of these bones. So now the ulna is on the left and the radius is on the right. A few things to point out. If we look at the picture on the left-hand side of the screen, where we're looking at an anterior view, you can see how the radius is somewhat smaller proximally. However, it flares out and becomes larger distally, whereas the ulna is thicker proximally and becomes smaller and thinner as it progresses distally towards the wrist. Pay close attention to the membrane in between these two bones. This is called an interosseous membrane. Interosseous means between the bones. And this membrane forms a joint. It's a special type of joint called a fibrous syndesmosis. Because we're going to get to joint soon, I wanted to point this out to you so that when we get to it again, it will ring a bell. Let's take a closer look at the radius and the ulna. By the way, in anatomical position, the radius is always going to be closest to the side of the thumb. That's where someone takes your radial pulse. When we look at the ulna, we notice that it has a hook hook shape appearance. Okay, it's got a hook shape appearance. The most proximal aspect of this hook also fits in posteriorly onto the humerus. And this portion of the ulna forms what's called the olecranon process. That is the olecranon process. Remember that olecranon process is going to fit into the olecranon fossa posteriorly on the humerus. Anteriorly, we have the smaller coronoid process of the ulna that fits into the coronoid fossa of the humerus on flexion. The olecranon process fits into the olecranon fossa on extension. The coronoid process fits into the coronoid fossa on flexion. In between these two processes, we have a notch that is referred to as the trochlear notch. The trochlear notch is the area of the ulna that rides around the trochlea of the humerus. As we continue distally on the ulna, we notice there is a tiny little needle-like process that sticks out at the end. That is the styloid process of the ulna. Remember, stylus means needle. Here we have the radius, which you'll notice the radial head here, Distal to the radial head is the radial neck. And the slump here is the radial tuberosity. 
again, a site for muscular attachment. As we follow the radius distally, remember the radius is much larger than the ulna and spreads out as it comes distally, you'll notice that there's also a styloid process of the radius at its distal aspect. If we look at the radial head more closely, you'll notice that there's this wonderful round divot in the head that will easily form a joint with the capitulum, that round ball on the distal aspect of the humerus. That allows not only for flexion and extension, this radial head can also pivot, allowing the radius to pivot over the ulna. So if I take my forearm and turn this way, the radius can pivot because of the radial head. When people fall, one of the things that they do instinctually is stretch out a hand to try to break their fall. When a person reaches back to break his fall with his hand, there are different things that can occur. A person might dislocate his wrist, dislocate his elbow, or dislocate his shoulder, or break a bone in his wrist, break his elbow, break his shoulder. If the radius fractures when someone stretches out a hand to break his fall, and that fractured piece displaces posteriorly, as you can easily see in the uppermost picture, that fracture has a special name because it was designated by a doctor who named it after himself. And this is a Collie's fracture. It's a fracture of the distal radius with posterior displacement of the fractured distal end. And we can see the fracture at the bottom most picture. However, we can't see the posterior displacement until we look at a lateral view of the x-rayed wrist. So here we can see that posterior displacement because you remember in anatomical position, palm forward is anterior, so the back of the hand is posterior. There is a very helpful mnemonic to use with the carpals. This mnemonic is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. It works when the hand and wrist are held with the anterior surface facing upright if you're trying to figure this out in lab. The mnemonic works by using the proximal row of carpals first and working from lateral to medial, then going back to the second row again working lateral to medial. So it requires an anterior view. We do the proximal row first, lateral to medial, then go to the distal row second, lateral to medial. How do I know that this view is the lateral aspect in order that I need to go in this direction? The pollex is the thumb, and the thumbs in anatomic position are always lateral. Let's go through this mnemonic. We start with scaphoid. Scaphoid is going to be closest to the radius if you happen to have a forearm in lab that has the radius attached to it. Some of the bones they have in lab are one of the two forearm bones and the wrist and hand. Sometimes the ulna is missing and that's why I always tell people to look for the expanded 
distal end of the radius to make sure that that is the radius. The scaphoid resembles a scaffold, a scaffold, which is a longer bone. It's one of the longest in the carpals. So we start with scaphoid and we say some lovers stands for lunate, tri is triquetrum, positions is pisiform. Pisiform is on top of triquetrum, so positions is on top. Then we go back to the thumb to work lateral to medial. That, trapezium, they, trapezoid, can't, capitate, handle, hamate. You'll know that handle and hamate, if you do this correctly, the hamate has a hook. So as long as you wind up on the bone with the hook, you've wound up on the hamate. Some lovers try positions, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, that they can't handle. Trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. Now, here's another clue. Trapezium is closest to the first metacarpal of the thumb. Trapezium and thumb rhyme. So that's a nice little mnemonic for you to be able to tell which carpals you're viewing when you're in lab. You want that anterior view so you can see and feel the hook of the hamate. We can't see pisiform on the posterior view. So always hold that hand upright. Going to the rest of the manus, we have five metacarpals which form the palm of your hand. We have the first metacarpal, the second metacarpal, the third metacarpal, the fourth metacarpal, and the fifth metacarpal. Notice that they're all written in Roman numerals. So if you were writing this down on the lab test, it would be metacarpal with a Roman numeral one, metacarpal with a Roman numeral two, and so on. Distal to the metacarpals are the phalanges. The phalanges in each manus include 14 long bones. These are actually long bones. We know they're long bones because they fit the definition of having a long shaft and expanded proximal and distal ends. Each of the phalanges is singularly a phalanx. Every digit, except for the pollux, has three phalanges. There is a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx. The pollux has only a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. Each manus has 14 phalanges. When we look at the digits, we name them according to the pollux being first. So the pollux is the first digit. The index finger is the second digit. The middle finger is the third digit. The ring finger is the fourth digit, and the pinky finger is the fifth digit. If there were a fracture of the middle phalanx of the fourth digit, that fracture would be here, if it were in the right hand. Should include that too. Can you identify the bones in these pictures? Let's do the wrist bones together. We know this is the anterior view of the wrist in the center picture at the bottom because we can see pisiform is on top of triquetrum. So let's go through the bones together. We have 
some lovers try positions, which is scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform. We go back to the side of the pollux, the thumb, that they can't handle. The trapezium is under the thumb. It rhymes. So trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Remember, hamate has a hook, which we can see right here. And you can feel it when you're in lab. We have metacarpal one, two, three, four, five, and we have the proximal, middle, and distal phalanx of the fourth digit of the right hand. The carpal tunnel is a narrow passageway for the median artery vein and nerve. The carpal tunnel is a structure that's formed by the carpal bones as well as the muscle tendons of the wrist flexors and the flexor retinaculum, which is a piece of dense regular connective tissue that forms an aponeurosis that helps to protect the tendons of those flexor muscles. Sometimes this tunnel becomes compressed, and when the tunnel becomes compressed, that can put pressure on the median nerve, which innervates the lateral aspect of the anterior side of the hand. And so a person might feel numbness, tingling, or pain on the anterior surface of the first three and a half digits on the palmar side of the hand due to carpal tunnel syndrome. A splint is a very common way to help relieve the pressure on the carpal tunnel and thereby helping the nerve to not send signals of pain or numbness or tingling. And that's something that can happen from a variety of reasons. There are cancer drugs that are sometimes associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. Sometimes repetitive motion can cause this or inflammation due to trauma. Uh, there are different causes for carpal tunnel syndrome. Sometimes in a worst case scenario, this would have to be resolved with surgery where they might actually snip a portion of the flexor retinaculum to relieve some of the pressure on the carpal tunnel. Here we have the pelvic girdle, which is made up of two coxal bones, which are sometimes known as innominate bones. I'm going to disappear from this picture so you can see these a little bit better without me in the way. The coxal bones or innominate bones are made up of three portions, the largest of which is called the ilium, which you can see in green in this picture on the right hand side. The ilium has a ridge known as the iliac crest. If we follow the iliac crest anteriorly, we come to a structure known as the anterior superior iliac spine. If we continue further down, we find the anterior inferior iliac spine. If we travel posteriorly on the iliac crest, we will run into the posterior superior iliac spine and then the posterior inferior iliac spine. Continuing along the ilium, we find a notch. This notch is known as the greater sciatic notch. If we look on the right-hand side of this picture, you'll notice that 
the anterior surface of the ilium, ilium contains the iliac fossa, where we find the muscle iliacus. All three portions of the coxal bone are going to contribute to a structure known as the acetabulum. The acetabulum forms a deeper socket for a ball and socket joint where the head of the femur articulates with this deeper acetabulum. That's the hip joint. Let's look at the next portion of the coxal bone, which is the ischium. Understand that looking at the picture on the left, we're getting more of a posterior view of the coxal bone. As we continue from the greater sciatic notch towards the ischium, we see a piece of the ischium that sticks out forming the ischial spine. Some people pronounce the word ischial and ischium. That is also correct. Just below the ischial spine is a smaller notch called the lesser sciatic notch. Then we come to a roughened, flattened area of the ischium known as the ischial tuberosity. If you were to reach underneath your bottom with your hands, sitting on your hands with your fingers facing your posterior, and you wiggled back and forth, you would feel the ischial tuberosity against your fingers. As we move towards the next portion of the coxal bone, which is the pubis, which you can see in lavender, we can see that the pubis has a branch or arm-like extension superiorly as well as inferiorly. Remember, a ramus is an arm-like or branch-like extension off of the angle of a bone. We have the superior pubic ramus. Superiorly, we have the inferior pubic ramus inferiorly. You'll notice the pubic tubercles on each side as well. Lastly, we have a hole. The hole is the obturator foramen. You can see that word here on the left as well as here on the right. The obturator foramen is only formed by the pubic bone and the ischium, whereas the acetabulum is formed by all three portions of the coxal bones. The obturator foramen is important because it allows blood vessels and nerves to pass through. Here we have some ligaments of the pelvis. The ligaments are named according to the structures to which they attach. If we look at the sacrospinous ligament, you'll notice that it goes from the sacrum to the ischial spine, hence the name sacrospinous ligament. We have the sacrotuberous ligament down here on the right is the label, going from the sacrum all the way down to the ischial tuberosity. 
and we see the posterior sacroiliac ligament going from the sacrum to the ilium. Let's see what structures we can see on this anterior view of the pelvic girdle. Here we have the iliac crest, which leads to the anterior superior iliac spine. Here we have the anterior inferior iliac spine. This is the acetabulum. Here we have the superior ramus of the pubis, the inferior ramus of the pubis, the pubic tubercles here. We have the obturator foramen. We also see the iliac fossa, where we would find the muscle iliacus. Here we have a posterior view of the pelvic girdle. If we follow the iliac crest posteriorly, we see the posterior superior iliac spine, the posterior inferior iliac spine, the greater sciatic notch, the ischial spine, the lesser sciatic notch. Here we can see the ischial tuberosity and the obturator foramen. We look at the difference between a male pelvis versus a female pelvis. The male pelvis is on the right on this slide. The female is on the left. The bones of the male pelvis are going to be thicker and heavier than they are in the female pelvis because men have more muscle mass. Remember Wolf's Law, stress on bone builds bone. That's why the male pelvis is going to be thicker and heavier than the female pelvis. The shape of the pelvic inlet, which is the internal area of the female pelvis, is going to be round or oval, whereas for the male, it tends to be more of a heart shape. The lesser pelvic cavity, which is below the pelvic brim, which is the bony structure around the opening. The lesser pelvic cavity in the female is going to be shorter and wider than it is in the male, which is longer and narrower. Also, for the female, the subpubic angle is much wider and greater in the female than it is in the male. I was learning about bones as a student. One of the things that we used to say was that the male was an inverted wine glass, wine glass, whereas the female was an inverted martini glass, much wider. I don't drink wine, I don't drink martinis, so I took their word for it. The pelvic outlet is the area where things essentially go out of the pelvic cavity and it's also going to be rounded and larger in the female for the purpose of giving birth and the pelvic outlet in the male is smaller. This is the last slide of this part and we're going to move on to the next portion for the appendicular skeleton.